welcome to the Governor Talks, our signature annual and spring meetings discussion with impactful policymakers. It is my great privilege to welcome the Governor of the Central Bank of Sweden, Stefan Ingves. Our discussion with Governor Ingves will focus on a wide range of issues from monetary policy normalization to high real estate prices and to the introduction of digital currencies. Governor Ingves has been governor of the Riksbank since 2006. He successfully navigated Sweden's recovery from the global financial crisis and the recent COVID-19 pandemic. Recently under his leadership, the Riksbank won the 2020 Central Banking FinTech and RegTech Global Award for Digital Currency Infrastructure. In 2021, he was voted Central Banker of the Year in Europe. Governor Ingves is also no stranger to the IMF, as he served as the Director of the Monetary and Financial Systems Department during 1999 to 2005, when he oversaw the initiation of the, the IMF's Financial Sector Assessment Program, the so-called FSAPS, which was created to guide reforms and reduce the incidence of stress in the financial sector. Governor Ingves, thank you for joining us uh, today. And I immediately start us off uh, with the first question. The Riksbank has effectively used a combination of unconventional and monetary policy tools to provide accommodation, negative interest rates, asset purchase programs, and forward guidance. It was the first central bank that phased out negative interest rates, and it also let its main asset purchase programs expire at the end of 2021. What are the lessons that the Riksbank has learned and what are the considerations that central banks should take into account in operationalizing monetary normalization? How do you see the sequencing and coordination among the various policy instruments? Well, first of all, given that we, where we are today, I wouldn't really use the word monetary policy normalization because clearly things are different now and very different compared to the way we were sort of thinking about when, when, what is going to happen next. And I recall us in a European context participating in exercising, exercises, uh, writing papers uh, with the title law, uh, low for long or low for longer. But now we're at, we are at a different juncture because inflation is uh, high, way above our target. So I'm not really talking about uh, normalization. I actually, I'm really talking about a different types of monetary policy in an environment where policy rates will have to go up. Let me add though one caveat because we have our policy rate decision on the 27th of April. So I'm staying out of kind of technical details and talking about these things in fairly, uh, fairly general terms. But given that that's where we are, rates globally are on their way up. And then, of course, Sweden being a small, very, very open economy, but when it comes to exports, imports, and capital flows, then we, we, we are affected by, uh, by that, and inflation is uh, way above uh, target. So it's time to start uh, tightening in one form or the other. But on that note, then, that, of course, raises the issue uh, what to do and, and how to do these things. Uh, technically speaking, uh, you can do these things any way you want. So it's not that you, there is a certain order between using your balance sheet or shrinking your balance sheet and raising the policy rate. You can do it whichever way you want and that probably differs substantially from country to country. In our case, the signaling effect using the policy rate in our judgment is much, much higher compared to let's say shrinking the balance sheet. Do you have any uh, views in terms of uh, uh, the long end and the short end of the yield curve which you are affecting uh, uh, by using these different instruments? Well, in our case, compared to some, uh, contrary to some other central banks, basically the, the duration of, of the portfolio that we hold is fairly short. Yeah. So in that sense, it's almost like a non-issue. Non and from a technical po point of view, it's not difficult at all to put the whole thing in, so to speak, runoff mode, and then the balance sheet will roughly shrink within three to five years, uh, something, uh, so something like that. So for us, it has never been an issue to, to sort of talk about the short end or the long mm -hmm. end uh, of the yield curve. And when it comes to buying, 
government debt, then we have bought the entire the entire yield curve, mm -hmm. and that of course also makes it easier when it comes to moving in the other uh, in the other direction. But this certainly differs in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned already rolling off uh, uh, the, the, the purchases mm -hmm. over time. Uh, do you have any considerations in terms of uh, the, the timing, how to go about it? Uh, do you think there is an optimal size of a central uh, uh, bank balance sheet uh, which you want to have and maintain at the end? Well, I've been a central banker now for a long time, and my only what I've sort of learned over those years is that using the, the word optimal, one should avoid. <laughs> and you will never know what, where you are heading because in an uncertain world, things just happen. And if you try to optimize, then almost all optimization is based on your knowledge about what happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. But you just don't know what happens tomorrow. So what you really need to do need to be able to do is to have the capacity to deliver things, to have the capacity to execute. But it's very hard ex ante to know how to execute. So if you can hold many types of assets, then well, you need to have the capacity to execute buying and selling many different types of assets. Uh, when it comes to uh, dealing with the policy rate, then you need to understand how you use the policy rate in combination with your, with your balance sheet. But you certainly cannot say in advance that there is an, I'd say that there is an optimal size of your balance sheet because that also, it varies and it varies substantially from country to country and from economy to economy. In many, many countries, and this holds for a large number of smaller IMF member countries, the banking sector kind of dominates the financial sector mm -hmm. completely. Well, then, of course, in that environment, asset purchases are not really that meaningful because there aren't any, there aren't any assets to buy. In our case, we have spent 30, 40 years trying to create domestic bond markets. Now those bond markets exist. Well, in that environment, then you, it, it sort of is natural to buy assets. But then when it comes in turn the bond market, given that our public sector debt is fairly low, then we can't buy the whole thing. So then, of course, you end up buying mortgage-backed securities and other types, of, uh, other types of assets. So part of the size of your balance sheet is going to be determined by the structure of the financial sector within which you are working. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so incredibly important to move beyond the aggregates when you think about monetary policy. So you really, really need to understand how you, your domestic financial sector operates. And, and that's what determines what is kind of doable or not doable for that matter in your environment. Also with regard to the different instruments uh, you have been purchasing. You are correct. Whether these are mortgage-backed securities mm -hmm. uh, uh, or government securities, mm -hmm. et cetera. I mean, it's, it's easy to say that from a theoretical point of view, maybe you should only buy government debt. But there, in my case, if there is not enough government debt, then what do you do? And, and also, sometimes people argue saying that you should absolutely not buy corporate debt. That's an absolute no-no. Yeah, but if you have a problem in the corporate debt market and not in the government bond market, why would you then in the first place buy, buy a t even more government paper? And, and not touch uh, certain markets, uh, markets at all. That rests on the assumption that the arbitrage within the system is almost always uh, perfect, mm -hmm. uh, which is rarely the case in real life. Mm -hmm. This also sounds like uh, it's tailored to country circumstances, how the markets function, the plumbing, behavioral function. That also means there is no uh, way for advanced economies versus emerging market economies uh, to go about uh, the winding down of the asset purchase program? No, you cannot, or you probably should not do it, do it in the same way uh, everywhere. And that's because in so many uh, emerging markets and in so many poor countries, you have a fairly rudimentary financial sector. And that really sets the constraints on what you can do and cannot do. And I mean, I come from an inflation targeting environment and uh, all my staff they've read all the textbooks they know all the equations and done all the fancy stuff but in a 
other environment in a different market, it's not meaningful to do that. So then sometimes you actually should do it the old fashioned fund way looking at net domestic assets <laughs> because that's the only thing that is practical, hands on and doable in that, in that environment. And then in that environment, you might have the ambition to become an inflation targeting central banks, but it takes you five, 10 years, maybe even longer than that to get to that point. Yeah. I have not heard that word uh, uh, NDA for a very long time and certainly not from an inflation <laughs> targeter. <laughs> yeah, but sometimes it's helpful because in too many cases, and you know that because this is the IMF, governments just and central banks are forced to print too much money. And if you cannot produce, let's say for the sake of the argument, a stable index, in order to measure inflation, then what can you do? Well, then you get back to NDA, and that makes sense in certain circumstances. Yeah. So we are going back to the good old days. Yeah, well, whether they were good or not, we can argue about that, but there was certainly something in it. Yeah. Good. Moving uh, to a different uh, 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 topic, uh, the issue of housing. Mm -hmm. Uh, the prolonged period of low interest rates created unintended consequences of very high real estate prices in many countries, including in Sweden. Households are vulnerable to interest rate increases as the majority of mortgages are at variable rates. While the balance sheets are healthier than before the GFC, the global financial crisis, rising interest rates are expected to have a negative effect not only on repayment capacities, but also on consumption and sentiment. In this context, should macroprudential policy target real uh, estate prices? How should policymakers proceed with normalization in countries with very high mortgage debt? This is, we just don't have the answer to that. Oh, that's and a pity. That's, <laughs> and that's, no, but that's because we, we have not in the past, and then I'm talking about going, going back a quite, quite a long time, lived in an environment with both low nominal rates and negative real mm -hmm. rates. And of course, in an environment with negative real rates, it's very, very favorable to borrow. And then of course, household have, households have done that. I mean, they've borrowed more than they have borrowed ever before. And in our case, the debt to disposable income now is at 200%, which is highest ever. And that of course means that in that environment, you are more affected by interest rate movements than probably ever before. On the one hand, in the short run, it's easy to service your debt because rates are so low. But on the other hand, if, uh, as you said, the majority of the borrowers have borrowed at a variable rate, then of course, when rates go up, it's gonna hit you immediately. And there is a, an, a direct connection between the policy rate and, and mortgage rates, and that means that the interest rate sensitivity that we have, or the interest rate elasticity in the system, particularly when it comes to the household sector, is higher than it has been probably ever, ever before. And that means that interest rates need not go up very much before you roughly have the same effect that we would have had, let's say, in the 90s when nominal rates were much, much higher. Now then, back to your question, what about macroprudential in, in, in all of this? And again, it depends on the structure of your housing market. Mm -hmm. I don't think that macroprudential ever can fix every imaginable problem in the housing market. In my own country, we have many, many different structural rigidities in our housing market, if I express myself politely. And that creates an environment where everything sort of is pushing households to borrow more and more and more. Now, given at the same time with free capital movements, the real rate is negative, then you end up doing more and more macroprudential uh, measures. But macroprudential, that's sort of a band-aid in one corner. And that probably works for a while, but at the same time, you need to be aware of the structural issues. And in many countries, you have supply problems because you have this thing called not in my backyard. 
And we certainly have no lack of land in, in, in Sweden, but still there are all sorts of issues when it comes to increasing the supply of, of housing. And that creates, that creates a difficult, uh, difficult situation. And how to really balance this, we just don't know. Time will tell, but households are certainly much more vulnerable today uh, than they used to be. Now then, when it comes to macroprudential, there are many aspects to it. One aspect is, of course, to put all the macroprudential measures in place before you run into trouble. Because then, essentially, what you do if you put in an amortization requirement, you increase equity in the system. Mm -hmm. And equity is risk-bearing. And that's a good thing, because the, the more leverage you have in the system as a whole, the more dangerous it gets. But having said that, at the same time, macroprudential is kind of increasing the policy rate without increasing the policy rate. Because most macroprudential measures, when you put them in place, make it harder to borrow. Mm -hmm. You have to amortize more, or you have uh, loan to value ceilings and all these things. And that kind of creates a shadow rate of interest mm -hmm. in the system. And that means that these systems will only work for as long as you can segment the credit market into different segments. And uh, whether that will last or not, I just don't know. Uh, because if you maintain regula regulatory frameworks of that type for too long, then usually you have sort of arbitrage and the arbitrage will undo what you, have to put, what you have put in place. But what also matters here is property taxes, mm -hmm. interest rate deductibility, and, and things like that. So in the end, when it comes to dealing with housing market issues, I'm a strong believer in also doing all sorts of structural things and things that you do on the fiscal side. Mm -hmm. So it certainly is not only about monetary policy and macroprudential. And then finally, on macroprudential, it's very good if the macroprudential authorities are independent, because there is a time perspective in this. And basically, macroprudential is about saying no. And most people don't like that. And then, of course, they go to the politician and, and say that the central bank is evil or the supervisors are evil. And here the issue, again, is the time perspective, because you have to do something today that people don't like so that you avoid a problem in the distant future. And that's very similar to monetary policy, inflation targeting, and environmental issues, because we hum human beings uh, are organized in, in our brains in such a way that we, try to, we tend to enjoy today. And then somebody's got to be there and say no. And uh, just to pick up one, uh, on one point you made, not just a monetary issue, not just a fiscal and a regulatory issue, but also Europe-wide a supply issue. Yes, because if you don't look into the supply issue, then basically if supply is constant, the only thing you can do is to reduce demand. And it would be much, much better for the well-being of, of any household sector in any country if supply is flexible enough because that will actually increase the well-being well of, uh, of the population, at least in my, in my view. Mm -hmm. Good. Moving to another topic, and I understand this is a topic uh, dear to your heart, and that's about digitalization. Uh, the pandemic has underscored the significance of digitalization in our daily lives and in the areas of finance and trade. Even before the pandemic, we were witnessing the creation of products which are yet to be well regulated and supervised, such as crypto assets and stable coins. Many central banks are accelerating their preparation for the issuance of central bank digital currencies. The Riksbank Bank is well advanced in testing its e-krona. What opportunities and risk do these developments present for Sweden? And what are the lessons uh, from the e-krona projects you can share with the rest of the world, which is trying to catch up on central bank digital currencies? Well, first of all, if you, I mean, we've been around since 1668. So we've tried all sorts of things in the past. Some of them worked, 
some of them did not work at all. And back in 1668, we, we used copper coins that weighed 20 kilos. Had we stuck to that, we would have been out of business for a long, a long time, a long, long time ago. So central banks basically have to move with the times. And in our case, uh, given that our technical environment is such that basically the con we are early adapters when it comes to new mm -hmm. technologies. So people on their own started moving out of physical cash. And then it, it became clear to us maybe sooner than in some other countries that cash, physical cash, that's yesterday's technology. And then given that it's been possible in our case for the general public to hold central bank money for a long, long time, we sort of felt that we better start looking into this. The issue is not physical banknotes. The real issue is to what extent it should, should be possible for the general public to hold central bank money in one form or, or the other. And that led us to start thinking about these things and to start talking about these things a little bit earlier than than in many other places. Having said that though, it's important to, to, to uh, stress that wholesale money has been digital for a long, long time. So here we're talking retail. Mm -hmm. And there is an element of symbolism when we're talking retail, which goes beyond the economics of it all because money has something to do with how you define a nation and the role of the central bank and the state. Now then, starting thinking about how to do this, creating a, a, a central bank digital currency. First of all, it took a while to kind of organize a project. And that was one lesson in itself. In the early days, it got too complicated, which uh, sometimes happened. And then we sort of had to scale back, uh, which is also another lesson that many have learned in many other places that if, you're an, if your ambition is to build a Cadillac or a Rolls Royce, maybe you should start with a Fiat 127. <laughs> because that increases the likelihood of the thing actually getting done. Mm -hmm. So we started the first phase of this, and that was essentially looking into various technologies and coming up with some very simple basic examples showing how you can move, so to speak, an e-krona from one cell phone to another. And then the second phase, which we have just recently finished, was to start working together with the finance, uh, financial sector, with a very few participants mm -hmm. and, and, and IT companies looking into the technical aspects of this and kind of broadening uh, the number of individuals uh, involved in this. We're still talking about the technical aspects. And uh, there were many lessons that we learned from that. And one lesson that, that, that we have spent time on and we're by far not done yet, is how do you, how do you deal with offline transactions? Mm -hmm. And how do you deal with system redundancy? And, and, and how do you think about those things? And how do you set it up in such a way that people feel at home uh, doing, uh, doing these things? Also, in parallel with this, we very quickly learned that this is not about technology only, because technically this can be done already, and sometimes it's successful, sometimes it's not. Look at the sand dollar, mm -hmm. or DM and Libra, which uh, wasn't successful uh, at all for various, uh, various reasons. But you also need support from the political system, mm -hmm and you need to create some kind of a buy-in so that people have a perception that this is going to, this is going to happen. Uh, this, might be, uh, this might be useful. You need to think about the features that you build into these systems. Mm -hmm. But you need support from the politicians at the end of the day because you need to eventually, I think, define the concept of legal tender in a technology-neutral way. Mm -hmm. So that money is money, regardless of whether it sits on a hard drive, is in the cloud, or is, it's uh, on a piece of uh, a piece of paper. And these projects, at the end of the day, actually need to move in in in, in parallel. Now we're moving into a third phase. Time will tell where that will take us, and we will design the third phase in such a way that the third phase will be scalable. So that if uh, uh, our politicians say, fine, 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 go ahead, 
then we can sort of scale it into an actual CBDC. Finally, I have the way I've been thinking about this, is, and given that I've been dealing with also IT issues for quite a number of years, is that I've concluded that today, if I make a comparison, you can actually buy a stock exchange on the technical side off shelf. And in the future, you will be able in a small country to buy a CBDC system off shelf. Okay. Because the technology is yeah. actually out there and, 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 yeah. and available. And here the fund has a very, very important role for many, many years to come because there are many companies out there in the private sector keen to sell this stuff to yeah. you. And then you actually need to know what you're buying. Yeah. And that's hard. That's pretty hard to understand what you're buying. And I'm, af I'm afraid that in the distant future, you run the risk of getting cheated. Yeah. Uh, so some countries uh, will probably be well served by getting some decent, solid technical av advice uh, within this field in the in the future. And it is exactly there where we were already active mm. uh, with a number of countries on providing advice when solutions were uh, uh, proposed by private providers. And also let me add that one thing I have concluded from this, and I wasn't thinking about this in this way at all when I started out a long time ago, was that if you study macro, then you assume that the underlying plumbing is constant. Mm -hmm. And you dislike it if the plumbing starts moving around and it upsets you. So you always tend to say, why don't you go back to the old way of doing things? But the plumbing is never constant. The plumbing actually changes over time. And now we have various types of technological shifts. And then you need to think through what is your vision of your own domestic monetary system. And this is very, very important. And most of us are trained to think about macro monetary policy price stability. Mm -hmm. And then we sort of think about and add financial stability to that. But that's not enough today because money is actually a competitive business. It's almost never expressed that way, but it actually is. So you also need to be able and capable of producing your own fiat currency in such a way that it is transactionally efficient. Because if it is not, then the general public can move to dollars, euros, libra, diem, who knows what. And once that has happened, then you have lost monetary policy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you know a lot about this in the fund because you, have, you always deal with countries that have dollarized or euroized. And suppose you have dollarized for the sake of the argument up to 90%. And there are countries like that. Yeah. Well then, domestic, monetary policy is 10%, and it doesn't matter to people. It's fun to talk about yeah. monetary policy, but it doesn't really matter. And this is why you really need to understand and try to be a bit bold when you do these things, because otherwise you run the risk of having people using other people's currencies, which might be a good thing. It certainly is a good thing in countries where you have created hyperinflation but it, it, goes, uh, it goes beyond that. And that's why you need to add this concept, transactional efficiency, and you need to understand at least bits and pieces uh, of it. You brought us full circle uh, from the 1600s that uh, money serves a purpose. Money needs to change and adapt over time uh, to serve that purpose. And in order to stay competitive, uh, uh, there is a reason why we have central bank digital currencies. Uh, thank you, Stefan, for a very exciting talk and very much uh, thank you for your insights. And I hope our audience uh, enjoyed uh, this discussion, which ranged from the current uh, issues in monetary policy towards dealing with housing price uh, issues towards finally uh, digital currencies. Thank you, Stefan, and thanks to all who are watching this. Thank you.